last year and then top aided another open the following week. Uh, both with company decks. He was an Obson mm -hmm. company player in Modern. He was a Bant company player when he top forward the Invitational. And he's playing Counters Company today. Good person to have in your Modern seat on that deck. Yeah, absolutely. So Frank Scarin winning the dial. He'll start on the play with Thraben and Spectre. This is like about last, just about a year ago, that every deck was starting on turn one Thraben Inspectors. This card has been notably absent for the last six months. And it has gotten better abstractly. As you see, there are two copies of Metallic Rebuke in Scarin's deck, a functional mana leak as long as you have that clue token in play. I love that. You know, we do see Mardu use it to turn on and license Disintegration, but, you know, I'd much rather be using Metallic Rebuke. Yes. Second Thraben Inspector, another tap land here for Scarin. And with uh, two clothes and to and toe now, you can just cast, cast Metallic Rebuke off of just one blue source now. All right, and those of you watching, we're aware we're having a, a, some, the cards are a little difficult to see right now. Uh, we'll get to that between, after the match, uh, but we'll call out some of the names for you during this game. For Mitchell Sachs, a tune with Ether is his play, getting two energy, finding a basic island. Pretty standard starts. And then, so this looks like the tempo game we're hoping to see here, as now Glorybound Initiate, our card from Amonkhet, is going to be hit the field for Scarin. What I love about this, the strategy he has, is he gets to play a trio of creatures, and now can start sitting behind cards like Metallic Rebuke and Spell Queller. Mm -hmm. What's really nice about the Glorybound Initiate is if you exert it, it becomes a 4-4, and it can attack right into things like this Rogue Refiner. Absolutely. You see Frank's drawing here. He missed his third land last turn, but it looks like he's found one. Does have the requisite mana to cast a number of the counters in his deck as he's, if he has drawn them. Sensor only costs two. Metallic Rebuke is castable because of those clue tokens. He's not able to cast Spell Queller with the mana available, which is a wrench in the plan here. Uh, an Aether Works Marvel on the following turn would be pretty problematic uh, unless he's drawn one of those uh, non-creature counter spells. All right, so Glorybound Initiate will attack with Exert. It becomes a 4-4 lifelink. That's going to be big enough that Mitchell's not going to want to block it. And Frank will continue. He'll make that land drop that he picked up in Prairie Stream and actually cast Selfless Spirit. So here's a window for Mitchell Sachs to try to resolve, well, the namesake card, the, the Aetherworks Marvel. Mm -hmm. and presumably, Scarin does not have a counter in hand. Um, it's also just the case that He's not relevantly ahead on the battlefield anyway. Uh, so sometimes you just have to kind of cast into the Marvel and see what happens. And Mitchell will actually cast Whirler Virtuoso. He may not have had, he had the land for Marvel. However, he didn't have it untapped. It was a copy of Lumbering Falls. Mm -hmm. So he makes the Virtuoso. Now, fortunately for Sax, he has seven energy. So he can make up to two Thopters this turn. That should be enough to keep Selfless Spirit at bay. Yes. It's a significant cost of energy, but the deck is very capable of reloading for an inevitable Aetherworks Marvel. It's also the case that now that Scarin has hit his third land drop, you have to be a bit concerned about a Spell Queller. Yeah, Scarin just passing the turn with three mana up. Gets to remove the Exert from Glorybound Initiate, so that will be able to attack next turn. If you were wondering, I'm sure you've seen plenty of Glorybound Initiate decks that feature some number of always watching for yeah. the combination with Exert. These, that was something I was looking for. These blue white decks have not yet adopted that. There's zero copies in Scarin's list. Uh, if this deck becomes more popular, I would expect to see at least one copy show up. Uh, if you recall, when this deck was previously popular, it was a heck of a card in the mirror. Yeah, I, and we're not yet at the point, I think, where Scarin's playing many mirror matches. Right. He's expecting mostly Marvel decks and zombie decks on the other side of the table where the always watching matters a bit less. Here's Aetherworks Marvel. Scarin, he will go ahead and cast Metall Metallic Rebuke for just a single blue using those two bl clue tokens to improvise. And then he'll sack one of the clue tokens to draw a card. So great conversion here by Scarin as Mitchell just plays another tap land. Now Frank's deck, this is one of the ones that I would assume, Ryan, is we didn't see this at the Pro Tour because it may not be that good against Mardu, but things have changed in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, these creatures don't size up terribly well against Marvel. Against Mardu? Uh, yeah, right, against Mardu. 
There's also more uncertainty as to what was going to be on the other side of the table. These tempo decks, they generally have to be pretty in tune with the metagame. You want to make sure that you size up well against uh, what the field is going to be. Fourth land from Scarin. That clue helped him continue making land drops. And now it looks like he will go for Walking Ballista on two. Some of the late game cards for Scarin, he's got this Ballista. Thea plays four copies of Gideon and four copies of Archangel Avacyn. Ballista will be made. And as it's Ballista on two, this is a great answer to Whirler Virtuoso. Yeah. Uh, the Ballista will be able to shoot down any potential Thopters as blockers. Scarin's also pretty happy if Sax just wants to expend energy making Thopters, because that right. means he won't have enough energy to activate a potential Marvel on the following turn. Scarin's going to swing the team. It's Selfless Spirit, both Thraven Inspectors, and once again with Exert, Glorybound Initiate. So it looks to me here that the Walking Ballista is ready to help finish off any of those creatures if Thraven Inspectors are blocked. But Mitchell's going to make a different play. He's going to double block Glorybound Initiate. Yeah, the way this lines up, you have a 4-4 four, four being blocked by five toughness of creatures. The Ballista can finish those off. And the Initiate couldn't even attack next turn anyway. I think Scarin's fine with this exchange. Four damage to Mitchell. And what I do like about how Scarin, just some minor sequencing here, he ordered both the creatures so that Virtuoso died, then let all the combat damage happen, then used Ballista to finish off the Refiner. This way, Mitchell can't sneak any Thopters onto the board. Or at least Scarin would know it was happening before he had to activate his Ballista. Exactly. So at seven energy, Mitchell does get an opportunity now to spin the Marvel. He could play it for four. Use six energy. Here we go. Top six cards. What can Mitchell do? He's Be a nice spot for Chandra. He's got in his main deck his big hits: three Chandra Flame Callers and four copies of Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger. That card's also just usually good. We see there's Ulamog in the top six. No Chandra. He probably would have preferred Chandra here. Yeah, being able to actually clean up the board. The Selfless Spirit actually probably makes it so Ulamog is better. Oh, you're right. There's the Spirit. So indestructible doesn't help there. Now Mitchell's down to nine. One Ulamog might not actually be enough here. That does sometimes happen, which is kind of funny. Consulting here with teammates, what to exile? And Sax is down to nine. When your life total is that low, right. creatures with evasion, uh, walking ballista with its reach, these are both very problematic problems. Mitchell will target walking ballista and selfless spirit with the trigger. So Selfless Spirit will sacrifice to make Frank's creatures indestructible. Ballista will send one damage upstairs. Mitchell's down to eight. Frank's last remaining creatures, just a pair of Thraben Inspectors. But on Mitchell's side, he's made the sixth land drop. And since Selfless Spirit is off the table, a Chandra off the top could seal this for him. Mm -hmm. And just facing down two Thraben Inspectors, he's not under too much duress. Back over to Scarin, draws a copy of Archangel Avacyn. Don't know if he has the fifth land to cast her just yet. Looks like he does not. Yeah, he just has to sacrifice the clue. Avison would have been a great answer to something like Chandra Flamecaller. Mm -hmm. And at 28, Scarin, technically, you won't take lethal damage from the Ulamog until three swings, but. You know, you get milled for that much anyway in All that right. kind of time. Ulamog eats your library. So Frank's whole turn there was to crack his second clue token, and then he played tapped an irrigated farmland. Yeah, three copies of irrigated farmland in Scarin's main deck. Um, pretty unfortunate to have as your fifth land drop. Ulamog will attack and exile 20 cards. Irrigated farmland is a... The, that's the, the blue-white dual land with cycling. Frank's deck... Seems like the type of deck that really benefits from having that kind of versatility in its lands. Well, that was always true about the previous iterations of the blue-white tempo deck, that when they drew the sixth and seventh land, it was very bad news. Right. Being able to cycle those lands is very helpful. Them entering the battlefield tapped, <laughs> particularly in this turn where he wants that mana, is pretty unfortunate. If it came off the clue token, you know, that's whatever. But uh, if he naturally drew it, it wouldn't have been good. So our first game result in, in over on the modern tables, Andrew Main, the company player with Counters Company, takes game one over team captain Jim Davis. So 20 cards go away, 10 damage. And for Mitchell, here's Whirler Virtuoso. That'll bring him up to four energy. Now, he's choosing to play that 
over Chandra. And now we see why. Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot brings him up to seven energies, valuing that marble spin. Yeah. And he it also doesn't need to clean up two Thraven Inspectors with any kind of expediency. Yeah, gains him life as well. He's up to 11, thanks to the Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot. This is a good, this is a secure place for Mitchell to play from. Mm -hmm. And it looks like a seventh land into the battlefield tapped. Playing in the sensor in this spot would not be ideal. I'll go back to Frank. Yeah. So Frank Scarin, I still had a healthy 18. Glory Bond Initiate gained him a lot of life here. However, as you mentioned, it looks like his his library will get exiled before his the life total. Right. You know, even. You almost never get dealt lethal damage by a new Lamog. <laughs> He's got a couple of chump blockers lined up. It, it's the ability to eat your library. Exactly. That, that's what does it. I got exactly, last modern tournament I played, I got exactly killed by a new Lamog. It's 13. He hit me with Ulamog and then played Ugin and plussed it. It was <laughs> very rude. It's like, wow, the exact damage. Yeah, Tron definitely has to get those chip shots <laughs> in. <laughs> Made me, no, and the best, worst part was early on in the game, I had been shocking off my dual lands just for bluff value because it's like, Tron doesn't deal damage. I, maybe I'll make him think I have something I don't. And then when he exacts me, he's like, well, boy, was I punished. Yeah, see that happen a lot. Rookie mistake. <laughs> All the time. Rookie mistake. <laughs> Frank Scarn is a co does have a copy of Stasis Snare there in his hand, but it's going to go, he's casting it on Ulamog, and then just has to say go. Not a great spot here for Frank, and Mitchell will go back to the Marvel. There's the Marvel activation, and then there's just the Chandra, the Chandra in Mitchell's hand. hand. Yeah. And all this one finds is a glimmer of genius. I'd be pretty or, content to spin yeah. Marvel and find glimmer every turn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what Mitchell will cast. Up to three energy. So right now... It, it's feeling like Team Marvel is still going to go ahead and get that first game. Yeah, he's just going to kind of pull ahead on card advantage. You know, Glimmer of Genius will allow him to filter his draws. He already has a Chandra that he's able to cast just on the following turn. Uh, it wouldn't be countered by Censored now. He'll be on tapping with the seven mana. So that's not an issue. And he's also just approaching the turn where he gets to 10 mana and is able to just start casting Ulamogs. Uh, Scarin actually has to close the game and that Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot is making it a lot harder than it was a couple turns ago. There was a window where he was at, where Sax was at 8 and Archangel Avacyn could potentially flash in, squeak in those last points of damage. But now he's at 11, a functional 14. It looks like Sax will be able to close this one. Right, and I mean, if he's that far ahead, actually just doing things like marveling into more Puzzle Knots? Yeah. Is, is very strong. Mm -hmm. See Mitchell up to 14 life, gets back up to six energy for, his, or seven energy for his marble. He'll spin it again. I'd be pretty happy just casting Chandra, but uh, Mitchell has yeah. bigger aspirations. Well, he did find an Ulamog <laughs> on the marble, so I do like that. And, and now he's gonna go for Frank's lands. Tranquil Cycle Sensor. And loses the two lands. Giving a bit of information away there, I guess this it's probable that Mitchell just assumes sensors in Frank's deck. Now he doesn't have to guess though. Whether intentional or not, you know, Mitchell Scarin does not know that Mitchell has a Chandra, but on the previous turn he did not commit a Chandra when he had six mana. Right. It's also a good chance that uh, Mitchell, if he's savvy keeping up a magic online, he's at least seen a similar list to what Scarin is playing. Declaration in Stone from Frank Scarin on the Ulamog. So his deck's actually, between Stasis Snare and Declaration, is capable of dealing with these Eldrazi's. Now, I'm not sure that's going to lead into a game win for him here. We'll have to see on that. He does swing two, gets, getting Mitchell down to 12. If this is the plan Mitchell wants to be on, as he casts Glimmer of Genius, he, I guess he could start trying to end step the Ulamogs. That would have played around Declaration and Stone. Yeah, that, that is an option. He's already seen a Stasis Snare, so that means that there's fewer of those available. 
He's main facing them right now, though, to take care of Frank's mana. It's a more aggressive line. Yeah, the double stone rain was really nice there. Now he has a hand with multiple Chandras. I mean, he's so far ahead that this is one of those games where worrying about that precise sequencing can sometimes cause you more problems than it's worth. Sure. He's got a long day of magic ahead of him. He's looking to play, you know, five more Swiss rounds and hopefully three more after that. Yeah, and these teams currently in a four-way tie, one of the four teams at eight and one. Uh, a win to start the day puts them in a strong position. We are saying 3-3 three, three from either of these teams would likely be good enough to, to make it into the top eight. Mm -hmm. um, starting that out on a win is a really comfortable place to play the tournament from. Yep. Chandra Flamecaller for Mitchell Sachs. And Frank does not have the mana for Metallic Rebuke. And the Planeswalker will hit the board. Two elementals join the Virtuoso. It's a swing for eight. That's half of Frank's life total. Yeah, this threatens to close the game in very short order. On the following turn, with the backup Chandra, you can make as many as four 3-1 elementals. Yeah, card here from Frank. It is finally his fifth land for the Archangel Avacyn, but may have come too late here. can technically buy Scarin some time, but the thing is, he's just tapping all of his lands to cast these spells that don't even size up entirely to the quality of Sax spells, and Sax is still just has Aetherworks Marvel on the battlefield. Yeah, well, what Frank seems to be thinking about is, is there any sort of bad composition in hand or misplay that Mitchell could make which would allow Frank to, say, sneak in that remaining 12 damage? Mm -hmm. He'll swing one Thraben Inspector. at Chandra, putting her down to four. The plan here seems to be that Scarin wants to commit Avacyn and uh, hopefully be able to kill the Chandra on the following turn, but Sax's hand is very well stocked. He has a second Chandra and actually a harnessed lightning for the Avacyn. Sax, you can use that clue on end step. Over on the legacy tables, Ben Friedman on blue-black control. It's like we have a control mirror here between Baker and Friedman. Uh, Baker, the Siltai version, so going for cards like Leovold, whereas Ben's just more removal, more card draw. Ben takes the first game. Mm -hmm. Chandra makes elementals for Mitchell. Looks like second Chandra might make more elementals. But he has Negate, Harness Lightning. Yeah, he's got protection for all kinds of stuff here. Yeah, yeah second Chandra is going to be the play. More, two more elementals. Five attackers here. Frank only representing two blockers at the moment. So as long as three get through, that is eight damage. The three small creatures are a two and a three and a three. That looks, looks to me like it adds up. That, that checks out. And f checks out too. Frank will scoop up the cards. So it is Mitchell Sachs on Teamer Marvel winning game one here. Yeah, so Scarin's deck, the idea is to go under, and he was able to counter the first Aetherworks Marvel. Uh, though once the second one hit the battlefield, he was really never able to recover from that point. As we go to the sideboards, on Mitchell Sack's side, we have three Tireless Tracker, three Sweltering Suns, two Negate, two Manglehorn, two Confiscation Coup, a Sphinx of the Final Word, a Dispel, and a Magma Spray. The Sweltering Sun seems solid enough that can deal with Glorybound Initiate, some Thraven Inspector, a Spell Queller that's hanging out in the battlefield that seems well enough positioned here. Uh, there's some argument for Sphinx of the Final Word if you expect your opponent to have a good amount of counter spells. Um, that's largely what the card does, so that, that's fine. Um, Magma Spray is a little bit aggressive as it doesn't kill Spell Queller. I probably wouldn't go towards that one, uh, but yeah. the heavier removal spells well, I do like. Magma Spray is interesting, right? So it does kill Glorybound Initiate, which would be very nice. Um, it, in a sense, kills Selfless Spirit, and then it, it forces Frank to sacrifice it. Um, I suppose the existence of spell, Selfless Spirit does make the Magma Spray considerably more relevant uh, if he wants to make these Sweltering Suns count. Yeah, but you're right that outside of those two cards, there aren't very many things it interacts with. Uh, a lot of those threats that Mitchell didn't see, Avacyn and Gideon, for example, Frank's heavy hitters, he's got to assume that they're there. Right. Yeah, Frank's not just playing this blue-white deck full of mopey creatures and minimal interaction. 
As we go over to Scarin's side, he has three Fumigate, two Sky Sovereigns, two Negates, an Eldrazi Sky Spawner, a Declaration of Stone, an Irrigated Farmland, a Descend Upon the Symbol, a Cast Out, a Dispel, a Metallic Rebuke, and a Jace on Ravel of Secrets. Uh, more counter spells, specifically the Metallic Rebuke to deal with Aetherworks Marvel on the way down. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I imagine the Cast Out will be coming in both as an answer to a Resolved Marvel or an Ulamog or a Chandra in a pinch. Yeah, in, by and large, this matchup, it seems like Frank the, wants to, just needs to avoid some of that awkwardness in game one where he didn't get onto the board quickly. Yeah. Um, the card, Whirler Virtuoso, seems like it might be Mitchell's m most important card here. Yeah, and that's why these metallic rebukes are particularly powerful, and the two negates will certainly be coming in, but they don't solve all of the problems. All right, so you guys joining us, we are here at our second team event of the season. Now, we still have a few more opens before we get to our season one invitational. This weekend, we are in Louisville, so it's the casting the team event. Next weekend, we'll be traveling over to Baltimore, where the tour will play some modern. Two weeks later, we'll be in Charlotte in the same format before we reach the season one invitational. That is a mixed format of modern and standard. So you still have a couple chances to win an open, come out and qualify for that. Uh, on the SEG Tour. Now, we're also winding down on the number of time chances you have to get some of these playmats for the season. We have exclusive art playmats from their formats. So for standard opens and classics, we're giving away a copy of these a the Aether Hub playmat. That's the land from Kaladesh. Uh, really has been a player in standard since this has been printed. Yeah, this, this land's very powerful. Uh, it really embarrasses Tendo Ice Bridge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for modern ones, we have Aether Vial. It is going to be the Kaladesh Masterpiece Series playmat. Uh, giving away modern classics and opens. And for Legacy, it is the Eternal Masters edition of Gamble. So all three playmats are available. They're free with entry to any Season 1 opener classic. Like I said, we have two more before our Invitational. Aether Vial, the upgraded version of Ice Cauldron. And Gamble, the red version of Good Cards. It was the Red Tutor, right? So we had... Right, it was like Enlightened Tutor, Worldly Tutor, Mystical Tutor, Vampiric Tutor, and then the red one was Gamble. Gamble came later than those cards. Right. Uh, those cards are from Visions. And are all four of those from Visions? Gamble's from Urza's Saga. Well, Vampiric Tutor's from Visions, Enlightened Tutor's from Mirage, Worldly Tutor's from Mirage, Mystical Tutor's from Mirage. Uh, but this is all well before yeah. Urza's Saga. I sometimes have heard to of it referred to as completing the cycle. You know, when they first gave everybody a, all colors of one mana tutor except for red. And yeah. they're like, people are like, hey, why doesn't red get a tutor? And they're like, all right, I'm this sure is what the red tutor looks like. We're designing them in Mirage. Like, should we do a red one? What's the red one going to find? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, Because they'd already done all the card types. And they're like, well, I kind of do like it flavorfully. It's a very, you know... Well, this is what the Red Tutor is. It's just, it, it's kind of dumb. Search your library for a card named Ironclaw Orcs. <laughs> Put it right on top. It's like Goblin Tutor. Yeah, you can find anything with a fail rate. <laughs> <laughs> Goblin Tutor is actually much more po powerful than you're giving it credit for. Goblin Matron would be Goblin Tutor. Well, that card's just good. That card's quite powerful. I would like it if Goblin Matron found you any Actually, goblin. no, uh, strike that. Uh, goblin re uh, Recruiter is Goblin Tutor. <laughs> and that card oh, is gosh. actually not legacy <laughs> legal because it's so messed up. You know, Goblin Matron, more powerful. found your deck, search your deck for a goblin, reveal it, put it in your hand, then discard a card at random. <laughs> yeah, goblins are only kind of good at their job. <laughs> Frank Scarin taking a mulligan to six here. You could put some stats on it then. You could make it a 2-2. Two -two. <laughs> I'm just still making the card unplayable. That's what matters. <laughs> what if it was a 2-2? Two -two? You know, can't block. <laughs> I did like the Ironclaw Orcs theme, whereas these were creatures. Well, they, 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 they're bullies, right? They're this 2-2. Two -two, he's like, yeah, I, don't, I only fight one once. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to fight a fight that you're going to lose. Right. No, it's very sensible. <laughs> Frank going back to the deck for a five-card hand here. Figures that it's going to take Jim a while to finish, so he may as well pile shuffle. Yeah, it does have to talk with Jim here. Remember, if both Jim and Frank lose their games here, that is going to be the round, regardless of what happens over in Legacy. Mm -hmm. 
and Dredge versus Counter's Company. I imagine that's a pretty rough bout for the Dredge deck. Well, yeah, this is Dredge is powerful, but not particularly interactive. One thing we saw with the Counter's Company deck, their Goldfish turn can be very fast if you don't interact with them. Mm -hmm. I assume it's actually faster than Dredge. The ability to Dark Blast Vizier of Remedies is pretty significant. Yeah, that's actually really strong. But, but the deck does have a lot else going on. You can, you can Dark Blast Viscera Seer as well. Uh, so that card is quite powerful in the matchup. Yeah, and to that end, uh, Jim Davis has taken the first sideboarded game. So it is one to one. Right, once Dredge becomes more interactive, he's got some plans. But I, him, Jim losing game one does, is not too surprising here. Right. Scaring keeping a five. Looks like it's not a great one, though. You can kind of see on his face his look of, well, I, I don't think this will win, but I don't know if four-card hand's any better. It's usually the case where your five-card hands, you, you got to look at what one or two things you're missing, how likely are you to hit, to hit them in time. It's rare. That, if you have a five-card hand that's just functional, congratulations. You know, that, that's usually not the case. Well, Frank has scribe to the top. So he starts on Port Town Revealing Island. So he has lands to play with. Well, at least two. And a Lumbering Falls for Mitchell Sachs. And it looks like mana is not the choking point. Yeah, Prairie Stream played by Frank. So he will get, make it to land three. Some good news, though, for the Gurus over in Legacy. 2-0, to zero, Ben Friedman takes both games and with that, the match. So while things may look rough for Frank, uh, they may not need his win this round. If Jim Davis can take game three, that'll be enough. Glorybound Initiate is made by Frank. Now it's on the third turn here, and it gets hit by Harnessed Lightning. So, so far, Frank is not able to push, push any advantage. Mm -hmm. At the very least, Sax won't be able to resolve an Aetherworks Marvel on this turn. So that's that's a little bit of good news for Scarin. Aether Hub into Rogue Refiner for Mitchell. Brings him up to five energy and nets him a card. You see in his hand a pair of Aetherworks Marvels. These are the kinds of games where Rogue Refiner can maybe actually just win the game without much help. Yeah, I mean, Frank is going to do a good job of keeping these Marvels under under control. However, he doesn't have the own the board right now. Mm -hmm. Rogue Reviner is a pretty pushed card in its own right. Three yeah. mana, three two that replaces itself. That's quite powerful. Right, it's a three mana, three two that draws a card, which is already very good. And in decks like Marvel decks, two energy, it's it's almost like this is drawing one and a half cards or something like that. Right. If you think you know six energy is a Marvel activation, well, I don't. Two energy is isn't nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's most of a Thopter. We see now Whirler Virtuoso is the, the play for Mitchell. Yeah, one-third of a Marvel spin, two-thirds of a Thopter. Pretty right. good conversion. Metallic Rebuke will hit the Whirler Virtuoso. Mitchell attacks and plays a land. Now, Mitchell did get Frank to counter something that wasn't Marvel. You see Frank pe continues to have to pass. Yeah, uh, when, when you're ahead on cards, and particularly because Sax is on the draw, He's already starting up the game that card anyway. And his deck is so heavy on Haymakers, he can just continue to cast good spells up and down the curve. Right. And that's going to attack Scarin. Meanwhile, he's still pressuring Scarin with this Rogue Refiner. He's just ahead on top of that. <laughs> Negate hits the Aetherworks Marvel from Mitchell. If you look at Mitchell's hand as he attunes here for land six, he's got another Marvel. He actually has Chandra Flamecaller in the sixth land in hand. So he's forcing Frank to have counter spells every turn. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that Sax will play around a potential sensor if uh, the mana is available for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Fourth land by Frank, and he has to pass it. Now, if Frank has to have a counter spell every turn, I guess the only way he can get on the board here is with a card like Spell Queller. Yep. And even that, that's outsized um, in terms of trading damage by the Rogue Refiner. It connects for three, and then if they end up in combat, they just trade. Uh, so even Spell Queller is not terribly powerful here. Mitchell Saxon in hand, he plays land six. He has Marvel, Virtuoso, and Chandra. He'll go for Aetherworks Marvel, and this time it resolves. Mitchell immediately spins for the top six. Yeah, this is some pretty bad news. If this finds a Chandra here, too, he can apply a lot of pressure on this turn. It you know, is Chandra. It's always the case that an Ulamog is really good. And if, if he hit that, 
he could take Scarin off of both of his white mana sources. So Chandra Flamecaller enters the battlefield through the Aetherworks Marvel. Will it be countered? It looks like the answer is no. So Chandra ticks up a pair of three ones enter the battlefield. The swing should be for nine. It's looking like Mitchell is going to take this one 2-0. Yep. Escarin's deck doesn't really have swingy cards. There's really not much in standard that you can even do from this spot to catch up. Well, right, because the issue is that Mitchell not only are one, his cards, Mythic Rares and Great. So pound for pound, they're good. He's playing two of them a turn, one from hand, one from Marvel. And that's just hard to come back from. And Skarin just stasis snared Rogue Refiner. Well, that yeah. doesn't really feel particularly bad if you're Mitchell. Yeah, he, well, he went to eight from the Elementals. He didn't want to go down to five. Mitchell cycles a land. See, he's got Puzzle Knot, a Tune, another Chandra. And if he's concerned about the cards Skarin has being Avacyn, he can just activate Chandra, cast other Chandra, and that would win through that exactly. on this turn. Chandra makes a pair of three ones. It's just going to attack with them. Here is Archangel Avacyn. She will block an elemental, so go, Frank drops to five. And because one of those was blocked, Mitchell could get an energy off the blocked one. The other one, Exiles, had a turn. That one will not give him an energy. And in tune with Ether and a Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot uh, among Sack's leftovers. Yeah, a lot more energy to, to use that Marvel again if he wants to. With Frank at five, it looks like Mitchell's just uh, figuring out the best way to do this. Mm -hmm. He can make a lot of energy. He can play and crack Puzzle Knot and cast a tune with his mana. It's like Whirler Virtuoso, Chandra the last cards. Yep, those are the last two. So plenty of energy makers. He could cast all of the non-Chandra spells on this turn, and Scarin's tapped out. That'd make it pretty easy to come in for lethal on the following turn. So here's a tune. Goes up to five energy. And this attune actually means that he'll have a seven man on the following turn, so if he needs to cast second Chandra, it couldn't even be censored. Whirler Virtuoso adding three to up to eight energy for Mitchell here. And now Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot, so he's up to 11 energy. Garen drawing up to his second card in hand. Remember, he was on a mold of five this game. Uh, but, yeah, Sack's spell quality has really just been higher. You know, we saw in the early game, Scarin had no difficulty hitting his land drops. So um, you know, he did think about this hand. So that must have been it. There just wasn't that many spells, which does happen when you're down on cards. Yeah, second Chandra is so... Glorybound Initiate from Frank. After Chandra is hit down to two. That will be able to trade with an elemental token. <laughs> yeah. And that is kind of the downside of these blue-white tempo decks is they're good at playing from ahead. They have a lot of difficulty from behind. Yeah, and that's really frequently true of, you know, your... Flash, Tempo, Delver, just blue blue attacking decks frequently are this way. You know, cards like Unsummon as in an aggressive deck or effects that bounce or do things like that are really powerful. You know, Spell Queller, mm -hmm. very powerful when you're ahead or even not very good when you're behind. And e even if you're talking about, well, you know, Frank Mulligan, this will happen. But uh, when you look at the deck on the other side of the table, he can mulligan Marvel and do it. Marvel can mulligan yeah. to five and still hit you with a turn four Ulamog. Yeah, we see here Chandra's going to go ahead and make a pair of Elementals. Lumbering Falls will activate. Mitchell making a ton of Thopters. Here's going to be the whole team swinging. Those two, we have, yeah, Thopters, Elementals, Lumbering Falls. That's going to be the game. 
and the match. So it is now goes to the team captains here, Andrew Main and Jim Davis in modern. They are in game three. We're going to bring you over to that one. It's Counters, Company, and Dredge. Uh, two zeros going opposite ways here in standard and mod and legacy. So, you know, Frank's deck was built to kind of slay that matchup. Um, didn't, it still looks like there could be, you know, it's probably still a good matchup for him, but mm. still losable. Uh, it's kind of the thing where it's a good matchup. It doesn't look like it in the games that it loses. Uh, right. I imagine almost none of the games are actually close. You know, you have your percentage based on raw aggregate data, and it's like I win, you know, 55, 60%, but it's like the games I the win, I win I, by a lot. The ones and I the lose games I bad. lose, I lose by a lot. Yeah, certainly. And especially with a deck like Team or Marvel with so many high-powered cards in the deck, um, it gets its, you know, 40% in most matchups just because when your cards are that good, it's hard to... That they'll, they will win games. Keeping up on card quality is going to be very difficult. All right, we're going to get you our modern match. This is Jim Davis and Andrew Main. So Dredge on Jim Davis' side, and Dredge is exactly what he is doing. Looking at that, that is the graveyard laid out there. It's got a Bloodcast Narc Amoeba in play, 16 life for Jim Davis. On Andrew Main's side, it looks like we have a Court of Calling being convoked here. He's just got Kitchen Finks in play, however. And uh, courting for Birds of Paradise here. Uh, presumably a collected company in hand that he's needing the mana to cast. Yeah, and it looks like now some surprised amalgams coming out of the yard from Jim. So those were triggered this turn. What's neat about these counters company decks is there's still some discussion as to what the lists are going to look like. Um, looks like Andrew Main is playing a walking ballista kill. He does have three viscera seers in his list, so he's heavier on combo on the traditional ops on combo. Mm -hmm. So Anders didn't get to untap. That Birds of Paradise is an extra mana source. And remains still at 20. But Jim's, Jim's deck's engine has started going. He doesn't appear to have a Dark Blast yet. So Jim's attack down to 14. There is, however, a Conflagrate in Jim's graveyard along with Life from the Loam. So a lot of times against these creature decks, that is a strategy that Jim goes for toward in the late game. Yep, you dred dredge your life from the loam, get yeah. a lot of lands into your graveyard, put them in your hand, suddenly you have a lot of cards in hand, you can conflagrate for a large number. And that's exactly what Jim's doing here. You see he dredges life, for the loam, life from the loam for the turn. He could, if he wanted to, this turn, his last card's Cathartic Reunion. I suppose he could just dredge a lot with Cathartic Reunion. Get most of his deck into the graveyard. Well, it looks like it's just Life from Loam and Cathartic Reunion. He doesn't have a third card to discard at this point in time. Right. He could loam for a fourth land, yes. make the land drop, yeah. and then discard one of the other lands. Yeah, he could loam back three lands, play one, fetch with that one, discard the other two to Reunion. Right. He's going to start by attacking Andrew Main down to nine. Jim having nine power in play. Main was at 18. But it's unclear whether or not Jim actually wants to set up a reunion when he could just get back lands and try to go for Lethal Conflagrate next turn. Yeah. So Life from the Loam's back, Loam's back three cards. Yeah, this actually, uh, he needs to have the extra land drop to Conflagrate anyway. Right. If so he's going to Loam on the same turn. So he's going to loan back the lands and immediately flashes back the second copy of Conflagrate. Has his three cards in hand. See how many he wants to discard. Yeah, collect a company, certainly on Jim's radar here. You know, and that just has to be it, right? That Andrew's, the courting for Birds of Paradise doesn't make much sense. And then passing with four mana up if Maine does not have collect a company here. Right. So he's going to cast Conflagrate. Starts to discuss with teammate Ben Friedman. What sort of combination of end step company, untap, do something else could mm -hmm. main have? It's, it, if you haven't seen the Counter's Company deck, it's actually, if the first company here hits Devoted Druid, it's not that hard for Andrew to just win. Right. And Jim doesn't have instant speed interaction. He's got to just dodge that. Looks like he did, went for three. So here is... Andrew Main casting Collected Company. And it looks like uh, Collected Company has got a mix of goodies. There's an Eternal Witness, Kitchen Finks, Viscera Seer. 
Kitchen Pink's Vistro here gets him the better part of a combo. Yeah. So this Conflagrate is still on the stack right now. That one makes sense from Andrew Main. Looks like it's probably likely doing one, one, and one. Jim discarded his whole hand. So Main look, looks at his cards. He has, as you mentioned, Viscera Seer. Also Eternal Witness, Kitchen Finks, and Duskwatch Recruiter. Certainly does not have the time or the mana to mess around with Duskwatch Recruiter. That one is among the lands as he's looking at right. them. It does watch Recruiter in these decks. Um, it's good with the de when you have the combo in play, it, it represents the win. Right. Um, because he doesn't have Devoted Druid, that doesn't work. Now, the Viscera Seer Kitchen Finks is interesting. That's most of his combo. He just finds Anafenza. It's a one of. However, he could witness back the Collected Company, except he doesn't have the mana. He could witness back his Court of Calling. Yeah, with the birds going down, you would need to have a land drop to be able to cast a company again. Looking at if he goes Witness Viscera Seer and gets back Court of Calling, can he set up a combo there? Witness Seer, no Finx in play. Oh, yeah, the Finx in play is about to die, isn't it? Right. Okay. He goes for Eternal Witness Kitchen Finks on the Collected Company. So that'll bring him up to 11. Well, that, no, it's for Court of Calling. This way, if he draws either combo piece, he'll be able to cord into the other. So if he finds Vizier right. Seer, he can find Vizier of Remedies or vice versa. So gets cord into his hand, draws. Draws Misty Rainforest. His hand is another Eternal Witness, a Court of Calling. So Mis Misty Rainforest is the play. Yeah. Cord Witness Walking Ballista is his hand. It's a good mix of cards, but I think he's too choked on mana to convert it. So he maybe can't win this turn, but can he buy himself another turn? Jim used his last Conflagrate. He only has nine power in play. Jim can Conflagrate for three on the following turn by dredging loam, or he, used his, he doesn't he have any Conflagrates anymore. He doesn't anymore. have one in the so yard. So he would have to flip it over by dredging the loam. Right, now he does have a Stinkweed Imp. This could happen, but yeah, if Andrew might be able just to lay up for the next turn. And in that case, he does have, you know, he gets four yeah. more mana. With, he gets with an Eternal untap. Witness plus Court of Calling, you know, that, that's enough material to Court of Calling twice. He has one third of his combo. Yeah, if each Court of Calling is another potential combo piece. Yeah, He'll the, just say go. Yeah, the biggest concern in, involves dre uh, Jim dredging into specific cards. And passing here is a show of strength from Andrew Main. Well, he's not going to win by chipping in. Yeah, I mean, no, you know, not casting B Witness or Ballista. Sure. That. So, cord for three is left up by Main. Both players know there's a cord in Main's hand. Jim now deciding what to dredge. He'd love to find Dark Blast in his yard, but if he finds it this turn, he actually can't do much with it. He can't dredge it until the next turn. If he dredges over it, he still has a Faithless Looting in his graveyard. Okay. He could flash that back and then dredge right. back the Dark Blast. Um, he'd have to so discard it, however. So it would have to be like with Life from the Loam, and then he doesn't have enough mana to actually execute this. If he just draws naturally and flashes back, yeah, if he draws naturally and flashes back Faithless Looting, he could end up with a Dark Blast in I his suppose hand. It's, yeah, it's fine if he dredges as well. What's he discussing here with teammate Ben Friedman? Yeah, I, there's no reason, you know, drawing naturally, he draws or dredges, gets a card in his hand, flashes back Faithless Looting. Yeah. Goes up to three, down to one. And for some reason, I was thinking that when you dredge, it just hangs out in your graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> you used mill instead yeah, of dredge. Yeah, that'd be a much worse mechanic. So one Dark Blast is a fine amount of interaction. Is is that even enough? I guess it hits Vizier of Remedies and Viscera Seer. So there's a lot to like about it. Mm -hmm. it, can break out, it can break up a number of combo setups. Gonna I actually to... should note here, I, I need to apologize to, to you guys. Um, Jim did not register Dark Blast this weekend. It's an interesting choice. Okay, so that actually changes things a lot. Um, 
Yeah. His yes. sideboard is Abrupt Decays, Maelstrom Pulses, Collective Brutalities, Thought Seizes, Lightning Axes, Nod of the Bone, Ghost Quarter, Bajooka Bog, Ancient Grudge, Vengeful Pharaoh. There's there's no way to deal with X1s. Yeah, the uh, Maelstrom Pulse, they're a little out of the ordinary for the Dredge sideboard. But how about this? He dredged a life from the loam for the turn and then flipped over another Conflagrate. So uh, if he wants it, he has the option to Conflagrate for three on this turn. So now he's just going to attack everything. And there's some pressure here, because now that the Conflagrate is flipped, Andrew Main actually has to block some of this damage. Hmm. He won't miss the Eternal Witness if he blocks that away. Right. That he, When sh the Witness got back Court of Calling, the job was already done. Right. Now, if Main blocks with Kitchen Finks, and Kitchen Finks has to persist back, that can muck up some of the Viscera Seer combos, right? Yeah, that uh, forces you to find a way to get the Kitchen Finks back up to a 3-2. Yeah. I guess if you're going for Anafenza Kindry Spirit, that's possible. You can just yeah. bolster onto it. Right. So Finks is going to trade with Prize to Malgum. Looks like six damage will come across. Main's going to make a play here before... Well, actually, he doesn't have to make a play before Finks dies if he goes this way. It'll come back as a 2-1. Right. He yeah, doesn't lose any mana on his Court of Calling. And I think that's what Main's trying to do. He wants to be able to end step that Court of Calling so that whatever he gets cannot be hit by Conflagrate. Mm -hmm. So this is really smart. Goes down to five on the attack. Finks will persist back, putting Andrew to seven. And yeah, then he can Cord for Anna Fenzon, end step on his turn, Eternal Witness okay. for Cord, Cord for Viscera Seer. Wow, all right. So, so Main is at seven now. Out of range of this Conflagrate, Jim is going to cast Life from the Loam for three lands. But this might be Jim's last turn. Andrew has Cord with Witness. And what to do here? Jim's debating, does he shoot these lands at the creatures? I guess removing Andrew's creatures makes his cord of callings, his cords of calling worse. The next one, the one he gets right, because next turn. Yeah, then there's fewer material there's to fewer work things, with. Fewer things, yeah. At some point, Jim needs to make sure he wins. You know, if he continues to make these plays where he casts conflagrates at Andrew's creatures, Andrew keeps getting more turns. Mm -hmm. It's tough, though. I mean, it's kind of up to Maine and how he blocks whether or not Jim is actually able to win. You know, the Conflagrate can't be lethal on this turn, and he needs to make sure that Maine does not do the infinite life combo. Yeah, so he really needs to take care of that Kitchen Finks on this turn. So they know about the Court of Calling that Maine is returning. Uh, Davis, I don't believe, knows about the Eternal Witness in hand, however. Conflagrate. Discard cast by Davis. Looks like it's going to be... Okay. They're going to go one at the Eternal Witness and one at their own Bloodgast. This is a neat play that Jim's doing so that he can play the land in his hand, bring back the Bloodgast, which will in turn bring back two copies of Prize to Malcolm. Yep. Yeah, after the Kitchen of Things traded away with, away with one, he had one that was already in the graveyard. This allows him to apply way more pressure to Main's life total on the following turn. All right. And Andrew's in the Court of Calling here for two. Go fetches down to six to do it. And you can tell with the speed that Andrew Main is playing, he's got something in mind. It's going to be Devoted Druid. All right. So he still has the other Eternal Witness in hand. He gets back Cord, and then he needs a land drop to be able to Cord for two to find Vizier. But if he finds that, then he yeah. can Ballista for lethal. So the judge has issued a slow play warning to Jim Davis's team, which does mean if this goes to turns, it'll go to seven additional turns instead of four. Five, but you're absolutely right. So he gets devoted Druid, and we'll walk you through the combo here. Andrew Main plays Eternal Witness, gets back Court of Calling. He's going to tap all five of his creatures to Court of Calling.
for two, five lands plus creatures, so he goes and gets Vizier of Remedies. Vizier of Remedies means that when the Travota Druid untaps, it doesn't get a minus one, minus one counter to do it. So it can just kind of tap for as much green as it wants. At that point, he makes as much green mana as he wants, and that Walking Ballista becomes a pretty nice card. Yeah. I actually didn't need the land because the Devoted Druid gets a free can roll do, on tapping can tap itself. twice. Yeah. And there is the combo. It's going to be Andrew Main in Modern leading his team to victory. So for Baker, Main, and Sachs, they win it with the Modern and Standard. And they stay at X and 1, getting a first win.